Hello, good morning. Morning. How about we try that again? Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Yeah, there you go. But it's good to see you folks today. Guess what? It's no snow. time. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for many that came yesterday afternoon and did some setup. And uh, isn't that a beautiful banner? Uh, the other one that was up there, this one, there's an Easter one, and there's seven other narrow banners that were given to us a couple weeks ago by one of the moms in uh, the homeschooling group. And uh, she personally made them and uh, wanted to know if we could use them, and they're just gorgeous. So we're grateful for that, and all those that helped out yesterday to set things up for the, the season, we're grateful for that. Thank you, so Putting doors down in the base, most of us don't. It's be kind of scary to go down in the old part. But that door with the um, boiler had had rusted, and you could see light <laughs> outside between the mason walls and the rust and eaten away. And it was an expensive door, and uh, hours to put it in, many days actually to put mortar. So we're grateful for that. To do that, we've got uh, well, good news. Our friend Doug's home from the hospital, yeah. and uh, he's there, and uh, on, on, so maybe continue to pray for the family. We have many people who are affected by the big C and uh, they're keeping their distance gratefully and uh, we thank you. So continue to remember them in prayer. Bo continues to have a sniffle and he's kind of, kind of, uh, need a big snot. And <laughs> 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 now he's, he, it, it kind of, it kind of hit him pretty hard. Others, it doesn't seem to bother us much, but a lot of that going around and so we're grateful for that. Our friend Bunny is still with us and, uh, didn't get to see her the last couple days. She wasn't up to visitors. And so uh, continue to remember her and, and Dick in prayer. And, and our friend Chris, we're grateful that you're helping us this morning. But this yesterday was the year anniversary of Todd's graduation into glory. And so uh, it's, you know, with family and all, it always takes, it's, it's just a challenging time. But then we transition into this wonderful season, what we call Christmas or Advent, where hope is renewed, eh? where we have uh, a perspective that uh, comes out, Emmanuel, God with us, that helps us and sustains us as we go through. So we are going to just start out by reading that classic passage, uh, just a verse in uh, Isaiah, and then Dave's going to open a prayer, and we're going to sing some songs. So Isaiah chapter, again, think of this 600 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Together. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. For extra credit means God, God is with us. us. Amen. Dave, lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we are, are so mindful at this time of year of God with us, that you gave up your infiniteness and constrained yourself to a body, you lived amongst sinful people you bore our sins on the cross so that we could be reconciled to you help us to keep that in the forefront through all the busyness of this holiday season that we would not miss the reason for the holiday season now, Lord, we pray that we will shut out the busyness around us, and for the next period of time, we will focus on you, that we will worship well, and that we will prepare our hearts to hear from your word. We ask it in Christ's name. Vacating the premises. 
there? Am I on? <coughs> sermon yet. You don't know if I'm on or not, right? Good to see you folks. So we're going to do a responsive reading today. It's a little bit different. This is the passage of scripture as we close out uh, the book of Revelation today. Okay? Uh, we're somewhat even. So you guys are the light side. You're the dark side. <laughs> I always wondered about that. <laughs> that didn't come out right. <laughs> Dun, 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 dun. No, sorry. <laughs> Who's in it? <laughs> we'll pray for you. All right, light side. <laughs> Here we go. And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his son, angel, to show his servant what must take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoers still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral, the murderers, idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come, let the one who desires to take the water of life without Christ. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. Revelation 22. Father, in the conclusion of this tremendous book, uh, significantly placed in the canon of Scripture at the end, with anticipation we look to the future. May you bless as we continue our study and prepare for your return understanding of the Scriptures. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Anybody like to do puzzles? Sometimes, who's a puzzle person? You're very puzzling, right? Yeah, yeah. So I haven't done a puzzle in a while, but can you can you imagine doing a puzzle with there's no picture? You know, think about that. So you got a thousand piece puzzle and there's no picture in the box. 
Uh huh. Wouldn't that be interesting? You'd probably start by at least getting the edges right, and at least the flat parts, and go from there. Wouldn't that be difficult? So with that, just to segue a little bit into this, we have been giving a we have been given a glimpse of future glories and prophecy. I think that we we don't have the full picture. We've been given chunks, scenarios. And, and how that piece is God's going to put together. We don't have a full picture in totality other than the whole a new heaven and a new earth. But he's given it us to give, to give a glimpse and understanding some of the things. And prophecy always comes to, it's always like, oh, that, see, that's how God did it. Now we go into the Advent season, nobody had a clue how God was going to fulfill the prophecies about being in Nazareth and being in Bethlehem and in Egypt and all those prophecies and yet he divinely orchestrated them. But he gave us a little scenarios, a little snippet here and there and brought it all together. Similar with the book of Revelation. This <coughs> is an awe-inspiring book. So, the reality is many of us have received uh, strong Answers, maybe from doctors, maybe from loved ones. Uh, even in the last week or two, I, you know, when we heard that Nancy was taken into heaven, others who have COVID, don't you just kind of, <sighs> we've had three or four family friends pass away in the last few weeks, you know, and it's just like, <sighs> now that same emotional response, put yourself in John's position. So he may be in his 80s, he's on the he's on island of Patmos, he's probably been beat up a bunch of times, he's, it's not the Hilton Inn, that's for sure, he's in exile, and God, he's, he's the disciple that had this affinity with Christ in a special way, and God revealed this to him and he wrote it down. Now, you know, we have probably looked at Revelation through the years and you, you're not, you know, this is not necessarily new material. Can you imagine the first couple times you read through the book of Revelation? <gasps> huh? So as they bring to conclusion this revelation of Jesus Christ, John is overwhelmed. In fact, we read a little bit here where he falls down and even worships the angels. No, 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 John, get up. You know, I'm a fellow servant like you worship God. He is taken back to the awe. And so with that, God, in Jesus in his revelation is wrapping up this tremendous prophecy of the future, which started out with uh, glory in heaven. There's messages to the churches. Then we see this transition in chapters 3, 4, and 5 in, in the Lamb of God. And then these judgments being poured out in Israel and Antichrist and, and dragons and this huge judgment. And now at the end, he's wrapping it up. Think about that. How do you wrap up a book like that? Pretty overwhelming. So I think the first thing as we look at it, what uh, the Lord Jesus did in this is that when John's sitting there and he's probably just trying to absorb it, we read a little bit of this last week in verse six and he said, these words are trustworthy and true. I mean, you grappling with the reality of what he just read is like, oh, and yet they are trustworthy and true. They came from the lips of the Lord Jesus, the resurrected Lord. And the Lord, the God of the spirits and the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants which must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. So it's trustworthy and true. As you read even the last couple of verses in this great book, there's a lot of these self-declarations. And we're not just hearing it. Uh, from any old person. We're hearing from Jesus himself, who declares that he not only is the spirit of the prophets, but he's the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's from the root and the descendants of David, and he's the bright and morning star. We're hearing it from him. His words are trustworthy and true. Amen? And even though we can't comprehend, or we find ourselves a little bit of <gasps> awe, what was it, shock and awe, a few years ago when, when we went into Kuwait? Shock and awe? Well, this is going to be shock and awe like nobody ever heard about or seen before. 
And so that's what we're dealing, and it's coming from God, and so it's trustworthy and true. So here, so as we look at this, there's two parts. There's, there's blessings, and then there's kind of some warnings as they wrap up this book. So the blessings are, yep, what I'm saying, hey, it's true, may not understand it, may not be able to figure out how and what, but it's trustworthy and true because I'm God. And then he goes on to say, is that to keep these words in verse in chapter, in, or excuse me, in verse seven? And behold, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Interesting concept of keeping the words, keeping them true, keeping in front of us. Don't add anything. You know, we're going to aspects of it and a little bit about adding to it and subtracting to it. Practicing the words. Think about the the message, the exhortations to the churches, and their their spiritual formation or lack of in certain areas were to keep the word in. And you know, I'm rather significant that John, in the Gospel of John, he talks about that he was the, in the beginning was the word. So we're talking about Jesus Christ, the living word of God. So we're to keep the word, keep it close, keep the practice. It, it's coming from, he's the logos, he's the living word. And to do so also for blood. Now, blessings are, you know, our gifts and, and come. He says, come. This is a wonderful thing. As you look at verse 17, he's inviting, uh, he's, in verse 17, he's in the spirit of the bride, say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. And let the one who desires to take the water of life without price, come. We sing a lot of those classic Advent hymns, oh come let us adore him, and uh, we, we, we come, he invites, this is a, you know, you may want to be thinking too in your, in your prayer life as, and as a church, this is a significant spiritual time for people, that God can work in hearts and lives as they reflect on the nativity, reflect on the Christmas season, that this is the desire of the Lord, come, come, I want you to come. He's not standoffish. He invites them earlier on to stand at the door and knock, which not necessarily means his salvation, but open the heart and let God and Jesus come in and take heart and to do. So he's come. We'll look at a few moments because it says coming soon. Have you ever scratched your head about that one? That was 2,000 years ago. I don't know the soon part yet. But he's come. So we're to come. Here's a Here's the words of the Lord Jesus. Read them with me in the Gospels when he says, Come, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's the message. That's just not Christmas, that's God, that's Jesus. Come to me. He understands heavy laden. He understands those who are laboring and need rest and the, the weariness of the soul. So he says, come to me. Another blessing that uh, for us as believers, interesting word here, recompense. Now this is not necessarily reward. It can be. But it, may, it basically comes from the word wages, uh, restitution, or reparations for the good and the bad. So it's not just I'm coming with gifts, part of it, but he's also coming with judgment and judgment for those who uh, will be deserving justice. So it's a, it's a combination. So here's the Lord Jesus, the ultimate judge. He said, behold, I am coming and I am bringing my recompense with me. For those, the sheep, they're going to receive the goats. Hmm? And so he is coming to make things right, to make, uh, be judicious in righteousness, and he will reward, and there will be the consequence of those who haven't accepted and haven't found him. There'll be the recompense. There'll be the wages of sin is, yeah. yeah. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Other blessings that he talks about, the white robe, washed robes, in verse 14. 
Blessed are those who wash their robes in symbolic of cleanliness and, and purity and, and salvation. We talk about white robes in, this, in the Revelation of those who have been martyred. But those whose robes are white are washed, and they will have the right to the tree of life. We've looked at that for the last couple weeks, that they'll become and, and, and they'll have the right to it for eternal life. And then he talks about in the last part of it that there will be grace to you. In verse 21, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with all, be with all. Amen. So grace is this gift, huh? Anybody getting ready for Christmas gifts? Uh huh. Anybody, anybody, did anybody do Black Friday online? Online. Oh, there you go. Yeah, there you go. He didn't get up at 4.30 anymore and do it. I didn't know. I think one and done. I did that years ago. Hey, he's, he's graced you. That's the word karos, that we grace and, and a gift and, and his ministry through the Christ. And so a grace to you, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So yes, he concludes this. He, he says grace to you. And, and then we conclude with amen. So be it. There's, so that it's an affirmation and confirmation of that in his blessings. Now, if you think back with me many years um, 1400 years prior to this, Israel came out of Egypt and uh, with the miraculous uh, plagues and, and came through the Red Sea and they went through uh, 40 years of wandering and then Deuteronomy, Moses is stepping aside and now Joshua is going to take over. Do you remember reading uh, Deuteronomy and the theme that comes across is the warning, I set before you you have a choice, blessings and curses. I set before you blessings and curses. Now, Moses is kind of, he's pushing 140 years, 120. None of us can quite relate, but I'm sure he had his moments. He was kind of maybe a little crusty because he had put up with the Israelites 40 years in the desert. Can you imagine that? 40 in, in some of the scenarios there. And so he, he knows that when he's off the scene and after a while, they're going to fall back into their old practices. So he's warning them. That's why you look, read it, and it's kind of like, wow, he's kind of abrasive. You know, he's warning. I'm setting this before you. Blessings and curses. If you do this and follow my decrees and laws, you will be blessed. If you choose to do this like the other nations, this is going to happen. So we go into... Joshua, the conquest of land's wonderful, but what happens after Joshua? You got this time of judges. judges, where they choose not to do the right thing in this, this se uh, sequence of events in their lives. So here as well, earlier in Revelations, he has a message to the churches, and they basically, they're, most of them had something that uh, was a positive, and then all but one, and the other one's a negative but I have this against you. So it's a choice, it's a thing. So here we are as we transition to the next part of this, this, there's a warning. So he's given us the blessing at the end of this book. He said, if you do these things, these are the blessings, grace to you, but here's the warnings as well. And so he goes on to say, and in the warnings or exhortations, don't seal up the book. Interesting thoughts, a lot of thoughts on that. I even know some, you know, a lot of different churches or denominations don't even talk about the end times much. Don't even, you know, it is complicated, and uh, some of them just have a very uh, a different eschatological perspective. Yep, the Lord's going to come back and everything will be good. It, it, the, he will probably surprise us, but you don't ignore it. We're not to seal up this book and put it on the shelf and not get it out. Not the physical book as well, but I mean the 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 warnings and the future of prophecy that God has revealed. I think some of that also has to do with heaven and hell reality. You know, you, this book is all about heaven and hell, right? I mean, I, I mentioned to you that I had gone with another couple pastors to a church three or four years ago of a, of a clergy that passed away, a colleague, and from the, the bishop that spoke, talked about the universal grace of God and that God and his love wouldn't send anybody to hell at this funeral just a couple weeks ago in Rockford. 
and that the universal concept and thought that's creeping into denominations as well. God sure doesn't. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell, but there's a reality there in Scripture. And, and so by not teaching that, you're sealing up the book. If, you, if you're by not addressing that there is a heaven and there's a hell, it's based on choices. You're sealing up the book and not getting, let alone how things are going to unfold and the interpretation of that. So we need to preach and teach the full counsel of God that he's coming back. We like the coming back part of all of that as well. So another warning that comes in place with that is that continue righteousness and holiness. Look at verse 11. So this is kind of wrapping this up. He says, uh, don't seal up the book of the prophecy, verse 11. Let the evildoers still do evil and the filthy still be filthy and the righteous still do righteous and the holy still be holy. He's kind of understanding the reality of what will be coming. But he says, let's maintain our righteousness, maintain our holiness. Easier said than done. Didn't, was it last week or the week before I used this word? the deconstruction of our faith. And we probably have known individuals that have walked away from the faith and made some poor choices. That's, that there's somewhere along the line, her, their faith was under attack and it started to deconstruct, slowly but surely. And so here he said, maintain, keep the righteousness, keep holy, keep your God's children, even in the midst of all of this. This uh, was in Dr. Jeremiah's book. I did it especially for the ladies because it's about snakes. <laughs> <laughs> Love you too. <laughs> so this was a missionary couple who were who were stationed in the in the jungle. This is their story. One day they told me an enormous snake, much larger than a man, slithered its way right in front through the front door into the kitchen of their simple room, of their home. And terrified, they ran out and searched frantically for a local who would know what to do. A machete-wielding neighbor came to the rescue, calmly marching into their home and decapitated the snake with one clean chop. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, the neighbor reemerged triumphantly and assured the missionaries that the reptile had been defeated. But there was a catch. He warned it was going to take a while for the snake to realize it was dead. <laughs> the snake's neurology and blood flow are such that it can take a considerable time for it to stop moving even after decapitation. For the next several hours, the missionaries were forced to wait outside while the snake's head thrashed about smashing furniture and flailing against the walls and windows, wreaking havoc until its body finally understood that it had no longer had a head. <laughs> At some point in their waiting, the missionaries told us they had a, a mutual epiphany. Do you see it, said the husband? Satan is a lot like the big old snake. He's already been defeated. He just doesn't know it yet. And in the meantime, he's going to do some damage. But never forget that he's a goner. I understand, too, that the fangs still can affect, too. They can lash out and get you. Well, make, let's make sure that the enemy, even though he has been, his wings have been clipped at the cross, still is active. And he is working, not, and he's tearing down his people and, and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in a lot of different ways. And we're to maintain the righteousness and maintain our holiness and, and watch our faith and guard it. Coming soon. And look at all the times it's mentioned in the Revelation. And I look at that and I'm going, behold, I'm coming soon. Yeah. When? You ever thought about that? And look at all the times it's mentioned there. This, these things will soon happen. Many times, or I am behold, I'm coming soon. Have you ever had a so I probably told this story before, but years and years ago, we had a member of our family who would always come late to dinner, and they were usually an hour late at least, you know. And you cook a meal and have it out there. It ended up, mom would just say, Oh, 
The meal's at 4 o'clock when she anticipated serving at 5. <laughs> and that did help a wee bit. <laughs> Anybody else? So I'll look at your neighbor. <laughs> uh, coming soon. But, you know, we don't like it when people are late. We have, we, our attention span or, or our, our patience. And yet, here we are. I mean, this, this book was written 1,900 years ago, huh? Coming soon. <laughs> to a theater near you. Or whatever. He is. So how do you interpret that? May I suggest, as I looked at some commentaries, that the aspect of being the eminent return of Christ, meaning at any point in time, to keep us vigilant and to keep us knowing that today could be the day, or that tomorrow could be the day. I'm coming soon. If he said anything, yeah, just hang out for 400 years. And can you imagine how the church would just kind of just, but I'm coming soon passage of scripture that we can read uh, from the gospel because we just don't know the time in Mark. Let's read together. But concerning, concerning that day or that hour no one knows. knows. Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. For to be vigilant and to be aware and we sing those songs, O come, O come, Emmanuel, come, the long-expected Jesus. Well, we do that as well as we see he's coming and he's coming soon. And one other aspect of a kind of a warning exhortation is that we want to be careful not to add or subtract to this book. Now that book, that has had multiple interpretations. No, I think initially and at least uh, it would be, Simple enough to say that the book of Revelation it's in its beginning and end, don't add to it. Some have taken this because this revelation, the book of Revelation, has been added to the end of the 66 canonical books that they're referring to the whole Bible. The revelation has stopped, don't add anything more or less. And I think that's probably fair interpretation, and I think there's reality with that as well. But how, what do you add to it? I, I think through the years we have to be careful, how understanding, we read it, we do our best to interpret, to understand it, but we better not distract or take away from the reality and we better not add anything to it. And that's the warning. I think we learned a little bit about that with the Pharisees and Sadducees in the Old Testament and the law, like 613 additions to it, adding to it, that's not really there. At the same time, we're not to subtract. We're not supposed to take away like a Thomas Jefferson type of a Bible. That, oh, I don't like that part. I don't want to study that part. I don't want to real the reality of that part. In its totality of it, who it is. So we're not to add or subtract from the book, and we're supposed to keep it. Once again, as, as again, imagine John the Elder Apostle, who's not a young chicken, and he's been... You know, stories have had that he had been boiled in oil and survived. That's just a tradition. Who knows? But he hadn't had an easy life. He's in his 80s probably. And he's got this incredible vision. And he's, huh? Oh. And so he winds this down. And he says, but I'm coming soon. Amen. So be it. Come, Lord Jesus. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And we wait. And we wait, trusting in his return, eminent return, at any point in time. I share some pictures with you, I think a couple of Christmases ago, I uh, referred to the World War I truce between the, Ru the Germans and the British, you know, in the, in the foxhole. And the, there's some of these older pictures uh, that just kind of, and that's a wonderful story. I think they made a movie about it. And some of these are the real, some of the real pictures are there and for that truce and things at Christmas time. And I think they played soccer and there was some kind of a Christmas tree and they sang hymns together. Uh, and the, the, the foxholes and dugouts of World War I were just uh, horrendous. And uh, it, you know, Christmas and bringing people together. But, uh, but to look at it in reality, Two or three days later, they were trying to kill each other. And uh, not trying.
trying to sound negative, but that we are in that place that the message of the gospel and the Advent is a wonderful blessing. And there's times of triumph and joy and peace and, and festiveness. And then it's like the snake's head still moving around and Satan is still messing things up. And uh, we continue to wait and we pray, like, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come to, you know, for the, your church, come for your people. And if you choose not to come at this moment, may we be faithful and serving at this point in time, faithfully as you called us. And may we be faithful to the end as we trust you. Because it concludes here with, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. We need the grace, don't we? Daily grace. It says, amen, so be it. I come, Lord Jesus, with anticipation, the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, we spent some time in communion. We reflected on this divine plan that was set into motion. Even from the beginning, Adam and Eve, and the curse, you know, it's the, the snake, it's going to bite your heel, but you're going to stop its head. All the way through that the Lord will unfold this great judgment that he's been preparing and all the judgments that are waiting and the triumph that one day every knee will bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we wait patiently. And we talk about his revelation and the truth that he's coming and we serve him. No matter what. No matter what situation, what circumstance, he's faithful. We choose to be faithful. We spent a few moments this week at prayer meeting in different translations of the scriptures, and it talked about, uh, you know, this, the righteous live by faith. The Net Bible translated in Isaiah, the righteous maintain their faith. That it's something that, yes, you make a decision of faith, but you also maintain it day in and day out with an affirmation. I choose to follow you, God by faith, unseen, unheard, other than your revealed word. I choose to believe you, despite whatever circumstance and situation, you've revealed who you are, what you're going to do, and I'm trusting you. That's what we say. Amen. And amen. And I think this, we conclude the aspect of when John the elder fell down in front of this angel, and the angel said, oh, don't worship me. His words were, Worship God. So when we have the <gasps> worship God. Lord, life is joy and blessing, a combination of so many things. We're grateful that you know and understand you experience that you're able to sympathize with our weakness. You understand pain and suffering and rejection and uh, anxiety and fear waiting. And yet, Father, in the midst of all of this, we affirm our faith with you, not only communing with you today, embracing the, the blood and the body of Christ, but even by faith, choosing to, under, to believe you that you are going to work all things out in conformity with the purposes of your will. And despite whatever may be out there, sicknesses, and all the challenges of life, we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We worship you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 67 in your hymn book. It's the same melody, but this is a different lyrics. Oh, come, let us adore him. Would you stand with me, please? 67. Jesus.
throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Blessings. Well, our missionaries as well, if you would.